So I'm Jason Ernst. I'm faculty here at uh, UCLA, and I'm going to be speaking about uh, computational methods for modeling and analyzing epigenomic data. So to motivate this, the human genome is about 3 billion base pairs long, but only 1% uh, codes for proteins. And as we've heard from um, many of the talks uh, this week and during CGSI, there's been a lot of success identifying genetic variants associated with a variety of uh, common diseases and phenotypes. And many of these, the vast majority, are falling into non-coding uh, regions of the genome. So many of these likely have regulatory effects, and this motivates a need to uh, better understand the non-coding regions of the genome and annotate the genome in general. Um, so in this talk, I'm going to give a background on epigenome-based, oh, sorry about that. Um, I'll give a background on epigenome-based annotations um, and talk about some um, initial work and how to model this computationally. And then I'll talk about um, sort of more in depth about uh, chromatin state modeling methodologies um, and then talk about some more recent work looking at uh, gene-based epigenomic modeling and human-mouse uh, epigenome conservation. So the DNA, um, we often think about it as A, C's, G's, and T's in the computer, but it's this physical molecule that's uh, wrapped around uh, nucleosome proteins uh, or nucleosomes, which are comprised of an octamer of histones, which can be subject to a variety of different chemical modifications. You have um, a lot of different possible modifications because there's specificity in terms of which specific histone proteins being modified, the specific amino acid residue, the type of chemical modification, um, whether it's, for example, a methyl or acetylation, and the number of occurrences. And you'll see notations such as H3, K4, ME3. And what this means is histone 3, lysine 4 is being trimethylated. Um, and it's often sort of, you can think of it as these, the DNA is wrapped around these beads, and then you have uh, often the tails of the histone protein sub subject to these chemical modifications. And this will be the uh, primary um, focus of what I'll talk about. There's also uh, DNA methylation, which is specific to CPGs, and this um, has value as a biomarker, which um, Iran uh, spoke about earlier this week, um, but it doesn't necessarily have as broad coverage um, of the genome because it's only measuring uh, places where you have uh, CPGs, and it's one specific um, epigenetic mark. Um, and another um, important aspect is there's this notion of accessible DNA, so where the DNA is wrapped around the nucleosomes, uh, the transcription factors can't bind, but where you have these nucleosome depleted regions, um, that's where you often have a lot of regulatory elements, and these can be directly measured with assays such as DNase-1 hypersensitivity, or um, more recently, an assay called ATAC-seq. And this whole uh, protein DNA complex is often referred to as chromatin. Um, so what's exciting about this epigenomic data is it becomes an avenue to start annotating the DNA sequence, which can be very hard to interpret directly, but oftentimes uh, potentially these epigenetic markers can signify important aspects of the genome. Um, so what you're seeing here is just a cartoon illustration of different epigenetic markers on top of the uh, genome sequence, so these could correspond to different histone modifications. And one important aspect of this is often you'll see the co-occurrence of multiple uh, different modifications together recurring um, multiple places in the genome. And then you can have also broad domains of a specific uh, marker. And one important aspect, or another important aspect of this type of data, um, in contrast to the DNA sequence is that you have a lot of diversity across cell types. When you look at every cell type of your body, you virtually have the same DNA sequence, but you can have a very um, vastly different 
epigenome, which often corresponds to important cell type biology. So if you look at embryonic stem cells, you might see a certain set of markers at certain positions in the genome. But then if you look at um, some neurons, you'll often see these uh, markers um, in different places. And it's often the case that, for the most part, you have um, similar combinations of marks co-occurring together. It's just the positions where they're occurring varies between uh, cell types. So what's um, enabled a lot of uh, sort of computational work in this field and sort of empowered the genome annotation has been this assay called chromatin immunoprecipitation with uh, massively parallel sequencing. And it's a similar assay um, used also to map uh, transcription factors. And the idea is that you have um, the different modified histone proteins uh, attached to the um, DNA, and you cross-link it, and you have an antibody. You can think of it as a lock fitting into a key, which recognizes the uh, pieces of DNA which have that modified uh, histone, and you purify it out. So in this case, all the places that had this pentagon modification are extracted. Um, then you uh, purify the DNA, and then you sequence, and then you map back to the genome. So you're specifically sequencing the places that had this specific histone modification. And then you'll have a different antibody that recognizes a different one. So then what you can get out of this sort of um, after the line reads are signal tracks. So this is showing the same genomic location in the same cell type for three different histone modifications. And you can see there's these different patterns of the marks. Um, and some marks have a broad domain. Other marks have um, a more punctate pattern. Um, and one thing which you might do with this data is to call peaks. And this is something which, uh, if you were at Jessica Lee's talk earlier in the week, she talked about a popular program, uh, MAX or MAX2. So this is a program for peak calling. It's used um, for also for transcription factor binding. But the idea is that you have um, a method that looks for places where you have significantly more reads uh, than you would expect. Um, there's one sort of complication when you work with histone modifications is you often have these uh, more uh, broader domains. And in that case, it's often ill-defined exactly what is meant by a domain because you can sort of partition it as like one broad domain or um, often two subdomains. Um, but what you're still doing is you're treating each mark um, individually. Um, but oftentimes, you can gain information by combining multiple marks at once. Um, and some of the early work at um, doing this, this was a paper um, from Bing Ren's group. They had mapped multiple different histone modifications, and they were interested in identifying promoters and um, enhancers. So they uh, did it in a supervised framework which, in which they took um, like known annotated transcription start sites, and then they had a marker for enhancers that wasn't histone modification, a specific uh, protein where uh, P300 bound, and then they had um, a certain set of, um, they looked for correlations in the patterns of a sliding window, so they had a certain um, sort of rule-based approach effectively um, based on curated examples um, to call promoters and enhancers. And since that work, there was a been a large set of um, supervised machine learning approaches using um, a lot of traditional approaches, such as uh, random forests, neural networks, uh, some supervised hidden Markov models to call um, uh, known types of elements, such as uh, promoters, and to some extent um, enhancers. But there's been limitations of trying to apply supervised machine learning um, in the epigenomic context, because um, it, it requires you to articulate exactly what you're interested in. And it's not always clear you know every um, type of genomic element you're in, interested in. Even if you know that you're interested in promoters or enhancers, you don't necessarily know like all the potential subclasses of promoters or enhancers you might be interested um, in finding. So there can be different types, whether it's something's an active promoter or a poise promoter, uh, bivalent or weakened um, 
promoter enhancer. And then the other um, issue is that you need training data um, to find these different classes, which you don't often um, have. So this motivated um, more unsupervised approaches. Um, and the, the one I'll uh, focus on is based on chromatin state modeling. So what we're trying to do now is uh, leverage multiple marks simultaneously in an unsupervised um, setting. So what you're seeing here is the data from uh, multiple different uh, histone modifications in one um, uh, sort of related protein, CDCF. And this is CHIP-seq um, data. So each row corresponds to the signal track of one of these different marks at one genomic region. And what you could start noticing is that we have these recurring uh, combinations, which I alluded to earlier. And in this case, you can see that um, where we have these set of marks together, they're at the transcription start sites of genes. And then we can also have these broader domains um, covering the gene body um, of like these marks. So ideally, what we'd like to do is be able to discover what are these patterns we're seeing, both the combinatorial and spatial patterns, and then annotate the genome uh, based on them. So what I uh, previously developed to look at this problem is a multivariate hidden Markov model uh, called ChromeHMM. So the underlying modeling assumption is that um, there's these different classes of genomic entities, whether they're like enhancers, which are these regulatory elements that can be far from the genes, but can be associated with uh, turning the genes on. You have the uh, starts of the genes, the gene bodies, intergenic regions, um, but you're not observing this directly. We're not using any prior uh, gene annotations. What you get after our pre-processing is binarized data for each um, input mark um, of whether we had a sufficient number of reads, in this case, in a 200 base pair interval. And we generally work at 200 base pairs, um, which roughly corresponds to the size of a nucleosome and spacer region. So then once um, we've binarized the data, then we can learn a, a hidden Markov model. And in this case, we're applying a multivariate hidden Markov model. So we're allowing ourselves to observe multiple different marks at any one position. It's not like at any given position, we can only observe one mark. So how we model the emission distribution is a pro with the product of independent Bernoulli random variables. So once you condition on a state, then the probability of some combination of marks that you're going to observe is determined by um, a set of Bernoulli random variables. Um, and it's sort of like an independence assumption naive, um, akin to what you make in naive Bayes, but you're conditioning on a specific state when you do that. Um, and then you also have transition probabilities between states, which, for example, here and here, we might not have observed any mark, but we could still infer that we're more likely in this state five based on the neighborhood information. It might be less likely we transition to another state and then back to this state, while over here we might reason we're in a different state. And what I'm showing you here are um, the different states of the hidden Markov model. So these are the hidden states, and they're associated with different probabilities of these different marks, and I'm showing you the marks with high probability associated with the different states. So the state one has a high probability of these marks, um, state two has a high probability of those, um, three, this one, and so forth. Um, and then, as I mentioned, all these parameters are learned unsupervised from the data. And just to mention that, um, so Chrome HMM um, is not the only sort of method that does something uh, similar to it, but it's become the most widely adopted. And I think what's one of the key differences with other approaches, uh, Segway was another earlier one, is um, how it models the emission distribution um, or the data. So Segway um, and a number, several other methods, they focus more on the continuous um, signal intensities, uh, while Chrome HMM focuses on the binarized data. And um, my sort of uh, rationale on the advantages of focusing on the binarized data is that um, it focuses the modeling power on discovering different combinations of marks, um, opposed to potentially overfitting not biologically 
uh, meaningful signal variation um, because a lot of times you can easily overfit noise if you focus your um, modeling on the exact intensity values. And in terms of loss of information, when you are reasoning about multiple marks at once and their spatial context, but then you're only at the end of the day interested in a single state annotation, you're actually not um, losing that much um, information about the actual signal because it's, um, there's redundancy between the multiple marks and the spatial information. Um, so then one of the sort of first large scale applications of this modeling approach was in the context of um, the second phase of the ENCODE project when it was first scaling up um, to produce genome-wide maps. So this was a collaboration with uh, Brad Bernstein's ENCODE uh, production group, which had mapped at the time um, these set of nine marks in nine human cell types. So this is looking at all the data at one genomic uh, region. And in order to apply this modeling approach to um, multiple cell types, what we simply did was we treated multiple cell types as if they were um, like additional chromosomes um, in one cell type. So it's a, this virtual concatenation of the genome, which provided common state definitions, but uh, dynamic uh, assignments of the genome. Um, so you could have, in the same location, you could get a chromatin state for each uh, cell type. And I'll illustrate that on the next slide. But once we learn one of these models, then we can go across the genome, annotate each location to being an instance of one of these states. Then we can compute enrichments for other um, known biological annotations, whether it's the start of genes, uh, evolutionarily conserved uh, regions where transcription factors bind, where genes are, and start giving annotations such as this is a um, active promoter or weak or poised promoter, different classes of enhancers, transcribed, repressed, heterochromatic uh, regions. So this is an illustration of the modeling approach at one genomic region where we have the same gene in four different cell types, and then you're seeing the rows correspond to the different input marks and then the intensity of um, that mark and that cell type. And you can see this is varying in different cell types. So then we're effectively summarizing all that information into a single chromatin state uh, per cell type. And this is showing in four. Um, down here it's showing this now for nine different um, cell types. Um, and then one of the applications I had mentioned was these types of um, data can be used to interpret uh, and analyze genetic variation that might be associated with disease. So this was um, sort of back um, when some of the first um, GWASs were coming out, there was sort of questions about all these hits what, um, were falling into the non-coding regions of the genome. Were they biologically uh, meaningful? And we were overlaying these um, maps that we now had with um, genetic variants that were um, all like different variants from the same uh, study. In this case, they were looking at erythrocytes associated with erythrocyte phenotypes, which can be associated with hypertension and cardiovascular disease. And the rows correspond to different cell and tissue types. The columns correspond to different lead SNPs. And what we saw was there was a significant number of SNPs that overlapped what we characterize as strong enhancer states, specifically in K562, which is the biologically relevant um, cell type. And since then, um, quite a number of groups have been using uh, these types of annotations and similar ones to um, analyze a lot of uh, GWAS uh, type uh, variants in um, more sophisticated approaches. Um, and another sort of follow-up we did was leveraging um, technology uh, called a massively parallel uh, reporter assay. So this was developed by uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Tarjay Mickelson, and a number of other groups around the same time. And once, so what this allows one to do is test in parallel tens of um, thousands of sequences um, where you put it in front of a reporter gene and then you get a barcoded sequence and you then sequence the barcode relevant to the sequence you designed. Um, so we tested a lot of different um, 
element locations in the genome which were already in a um, DNA accessible site, so they had a peak of hypersensitivity. But then we uh, did a stratified random sampling to include locations selected from these different chromatin states and showed that what we characterize as like an active promoter or an enhancer had the highest activity, while a weaker promoter had um, an intermediate activity on average. And some of these places, even though they were accessible DNA, they had lower activity. So this was showing um, that this high throughput reporter assay was validating that these chromatin states um, provided additional information about the uh, regulatory potential of different elements. And there's uh, more details about this in the paper, including how we further identified at a higher resolution where the regulatory sites are. Um, so once um, we sort of demonstrated this approach on a smaller number of cell types, there's interest in um, applying it now to many more cell and tissue types. And this was in the context of the NIH uh, Roadmap Epigenomics Project, where they had mapped um, in over 100 cell and tissue types, a panel of uh, five marks in every cell and tissue type. And then there was a subset of marks that had been mapped in uh, different uh, levels of coverage. So there's some marks that were still mapped in a lot of the cell and tissue types, but not every one. And then others that had more uh, sparser uh, coverage. Um, so there was a question of how we could apply uh, Chrome HMM in this context. So each uh, sort of blue dot in this represents we have at least one experiment for any given um, uh, combination of that cell type in that arc. Um, so what we did um, first was we could apply Chrome HMM to the five marks that we had mapped in every uh, cell and tissue type, and this was a 15-state model based on the observed data. And what you're seeing here, the rows correspond to different cell and tissue types, and then the colors correspond to the annotation, so what location, what state that um, position in the genome was assigned to. Um, but I mean, what you might be noticing here is we have all this additional data that we're not uh, leveraging. And I mean, there's a question of what we should do about it. I mean, we could add additional marks, but then not have every cell and tissue type. And we did that with uh, one additional mark, H3K27 acetylation, and we uh, produced a chromatin state map covering 98 of the cell and tissue types. Uh, but we looked at an um, alternative approach here, and that is to um, impute uh, missing experiments. So the idea is that we ha now have um, this grid that we'd like to fill in where we don't have any data in a specific combination for that um, mark and cell type, but we've seen that mark in other cell and tissue types and we've seen other marks in that specific uh, cell and tissue type. So I developed a method uh, called chrome impute, which um, predicts a missing mark signal track in a cell type uh, by integrating information from the other marks available in the same cell type. So the idea is we can learn from other cell and tissue types the correlation structure between marks, and then also leverage what that mark looked like in other cell and tissue types, uh, particularly uh, very similar cell and tissue types. Um, so then what we defined a set of um, features based on for that. The details are in the paper. Um, and then we used an ensemble of regression trees to integrate uh, th this information um, to make a prediction where we trained on the other cell and tissue types where we had that mark available in and then applied it into the missing, um, the target cell type. So the leaves would predict numerical values, and then the, feature, the um, nodes here would be on a different uh, features, either as a mark that we had in that cell and tissue type, or um, we had these k-nearest neighbor features, which were based on the um, average signal of that um, mark we're trying to predict in other cell types that were de determined to be similar based on other marks. And what you're seeing here is a visual representation of um, the output uh, where the red is the imputed data and then blue is the observed data. And this imputed data was generated without knowledge of the observed uh, data. It was held out for that specific prediction. So you can see there's a strong agreement and we have a lot of quantitative evaluations of this in the uh, paper. 
But once we had um, these imputed data, then we could apply Chrome HMM um, directly to the imputed data. In this case, we focused on the 12 marks for which we already had that mark mapped enough cell and tissue types, so we were sort of confident in using it. Um, and then we produced, in this case here, a 25-state model based on uh, 12 marks, um, and then annotated the genome based on these 127 cell and tissue types. So the imputed data sort of has these two advantages. One, the most obvious one is we can fill in these missing mark cell type combinations, but there's a more subtle advantage is that when we make these predictions, we're combining information from dozens of very closely related experiments opposed to relying directly on um, the observed data, which can be based on like one or two replicates often. So there's a statistical robustness you gain um, when you combine information from lots of experiments, even though it might introduce um, some uh, biases, but uh, you're controlling a lot of the variance and noise through this process. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the ones that are in pink, um, so we have the observed data, but then we also um, imputed the data. So we, we held that um, mark out and then predicted it. And um, I mean, so we did that for, I mean, one of it was this reason I just mentioned that there's advantages, even if we have the data set, it can control the noise. So uh, we'll often actually focus on just using the imputed data for all the marks, even if we had um, the observed data available. And then there's another application, and that's um, for quality control. Like if you want to flag data sets that are not agreeing with what you would expect it to look like, um, you can compare the observed to the imputed data, because the imputed data is sort of effectively formally stating what your expectation for that data set looks like. Yeah, so there's a couple data sets um, where we only have um, the observed data. So that's because if, if we um, only have that mark available in one cell or tissue type, um, and then we have to hold it out when we predict it, we can't um, have an imputed version of that because we have nothing to train on. Any other questions so far? Um, Okay, so then um, I had focused here on this concatenated approach um, to applying Chrome HMM in the context of multiple cell types. So in this setting here, we have this common set of state definitions, but we have cell type specific state assignments. Um, there's actually two other ways uh, that one could do this with the Chrome HMM. One is you could learn independent models for each uh, cell type. The challenge here is then um, it makes it hard to compare cell types. And then when you're dealing with lots of cell types, um, it's like impossible to give a manual interpretation to each uh, state in when you have a hundred uh, different models with uh, potentially a dozen or more states. Um, there's been some work by other groups that have tried to do machine learning based approaches to automatically give interpretations to the states, but it still doesn't resolve the issue of um, the states not aligning with each other across cell types. Um, but there's another approach that we sort of described in this uh, protocols paper, but it's been uh, somewhat underutilized previously, and that is to just um, stack all the data together. Um, regardless of what cell type it's from. So you're treat effectively treating data from additional cell types as if they were additional marks. So then you get a single annotation of the genome, uh, but then you get um, based on all the data. So the model becomes more complicated, but it then simplifies the genome uh, annotation. And I'll illustrate um, this modeling approach. So as I mentioned, um, the stack modeling um, it's complementary to this concatenated modeling. Um, it simplifies the annotation output. And then it also, um, other advantages, it can bypass the need to pick um, one cell type or um, consider all of them. So a lot of applications, um, you might be, for example, working with uh, 
data that are from like genetic variants or sequence conservation. It might not be natural to a priori just pick one cell type uh, to focus on, and then it might get unwieldy if you're trying to look at hundreds of different annotations of uh, 15 states um, at, at one time. So what we'd like to do is sort of focus on this um, one simplified annotation. And um, you're leveraging more data simultaneously for genome annotation. And um, we're also able to differentiate constitutive from um, cell type specific, as I'll demonstrate. And we had um, some sort of small scale applications of this modeling approach. This is work I had done in collaboration with Catherine Plass Lab um, here looking at IPS uh, reprogramming, which um, modeled when we overexpressed Yamanaka factors to, con to convert fibroblast cells into um, IPS cells. And we applied here each state corresponds to e either some combination of stage or um, mark being present. But um, previously, it hadn't been applied on a large scale, um, for example, in the context of the roadmap epigenomics data, where we had more than a 1,000 data sets, and required some uh, uh, engineering of chrome-HMM to scale this um, up. But what you're seeing now is a model that we had uh, published earlier this year, uh, where we had 100 states based on a thousand, over 1,000 data sets. Um, and now, so the rows are the different states, the columns are the different um, experiments. And different states now can capture some of the cell type specific behavior. For, for example, this is a state which is associated here uh, with enhancers in um, specifically ES or IPS cells. So the top is the annotation from the uh, stacked chrome HMM. So you're getting the single annotation of the genome, and we've grouped the states into these groups. So this is an active enhancer state, and then we have more detailed information that it's associated with ES and IPS cells. But if you were looking at the concatenated output, um, I mean, you would have a lot more information here, um, but you can see it's associated with enhancers, and ES and IPS, but this is effectively summarizing all that into one annotation. Um, and then we can also have some states that correspond to like a single mark, um, but then it's similar across cell types. So this is a state which was recognized that's associated with DNA accessible regions, but limited histone uh, modifications. Um, and this is often associated with CDCF binding. And there's many more states that are described in detail in the paper. Um, just to mention um, work uh, this was uh, from another group, uh, Rahul Satija, which, um, so he's one of sort of the leaders in uh, single cell analysis. They published earlier this year um, a method, uh, single cell chrome HMM, where they were building on top of chrome HMM to um, start annotating chromatin states at the single cell level. And the challenge here is that um, even if you can map um, so traditionally mapping like histone modifications at the single cell level has been um, more challenging than like RNA-seq or TAC-seq. Um, but then if we're trying to define chromatin states based on multiple marks, there's an additional challenge that we need to associate multiple marks um, with the same uh, cell type. And there's been some uh, work, and it's an ongoing thing to sort of do these um, multimodal assays, but with multiple histone modifications. But his strategy was to um, measure protein markers um, that can be used to anchor the cells, to align the cells. And then um, once you have those alignment of cells, then you can determine that uh, different uh, chip seek um, or histone prof modification profile maps correspond to the same cell type. And then they learned one chrome HMM model, but then gave a, sp a separate assignment for every individual cell type. And there's more details about this in their paper. Um, so now to briefly talk about um, some uh, more recent work. Um, so one thing about this, these chromatin states is everything's position-based. But then for many other genomic analyses, such as uh, transcriptomics, people tend to focus on genes. And when you look about, um, like across the genes, you're going to see different combinations 
of marks. So this was what I was showing earlier. You can see like in the promoter region, we have a certain set of marks. And then um, along the gene body, we have a different set of marks. Um, and oftentimes, like people might just focus on what is the chromatin state at the TSS, or they might average all the signal across the marks. But either of those would lose a lot of information. Um, so we were thinking, could we have a more principled um, modeling approach to this? Um, so we, um, with my former student, um, we looked at this um, from the perspective of using a mixture of hidden Markov models. So what we're doing is assuming that every gene uh, profile is associated with uh, one um, hidden Markov model. And then the hidden Markov models, each individual hidden Markov model, like the chrome HMM models I presented earlier, the same um, emission distribution, uh, but we tend to use a smaller number of states uh, for each mixture component. And then once we learn these models, then we can assign each gene to its, um, the component that was most likely to generate it. Um, so this is showing you um, a model that we had learned on that same uh, roadmap epigenomics data, um, focusing on, in this case, the imputed data. So each uh, set of three states corresponds to one mixture component, and then each one of these is a substate of the HMM. And then um, the darker means we have more that probability for that mark in that uh, substate. Um, so then we characterize, in this case, 12 mixture components. What you're seeing here, the rows correspond to different genes, the columns, different cell types. So what we're producing for every gene is one chromatin or one um, chrome gene annotation um, per cell type. So we're not doing these position annotations. We're now doing gene annotations based on all the marks um, from the flanking regions um, across the gene, including the intronic regions. Um, and we can see a large separation of expression levels associated with different um, comp uh, mixture components. And then one question we had is like, is this adding additional information beyond uh, gene expression? And we looked at that in a couple ways. This is one example of this where we took um, annotations of genes with high probability of um, loss of, of function intolerance. Um, so these are high PLI genes. Um, so the x-axis shows the expression, the y-axis the proportion of high PLI genes, and then each point is a combination of uh, cell type and uh, mixture component. And you can see, for example, we have two Mixture components have a similar expression level, but very different likelihood of being a high PLI gene. And similar over here on the lower express, we have a set that um, are not really expressed in a given cell type, but then still have, in some cases, above average um, PLI versus some that basically ne are never high PLI. Yeah. Um, yes, yes, uh, thanks for asking. So um, some of them here, like the bottom one, this quiescent one, is regions that are, um, you're not seeing any marks at all, and these tend to enrich for olfactory genes. Um, this bivalent uh, mixture component is associated with like K27ME3, K4ME3, and like the first state here tends to be what's um, at the promoter region, and then the next ones are further from the promoter. So then um, here you're sort of having the bivalent in the promoter, and then this is K27ME3 in the gene body. We have another mixture component that tends to be associated with uh, zinc finger genes. Um, and then this top one here, this is associated with a lot of strong transcription and enhancer marks. Um, so these tend to be very active genes. And, and how do you, so I'm, I'm kind of trying to capture some of the information that you're looking for the chromatin or the state, and you're using the state to Yeah, yeah. So the, we don't transition between mixture components. So once you're in a gene, um, 
the modeling assumption is you stay within the mixture components. So you can transition between those substates, but you can't transition between the substates of another mixture component. So every gene has to effectively pick one of these sort of HMMs to generate it. Yeah. Yeah, so you can think of it, it's analogous to like a mixture of Gaussians, but instead of the Gaussian, uh, we have an HMM. Um, and then, um, uh, briefly, uh, just to talk about this last part, looking at um, human uh, mouse comparisons. So there's been a lot of uh, work also mapping epigenome in mouse, which is a key model organism to human. I'm showing here this uh, paper that was in Nature two years ago from Bing Ren's group, where they applied uh, Chrome HMM to a lot of data from um, mouse, and particularly they were focused on development. Um, but more generally, we're sort of looking at this question that uh, people are interested to know, like to what extent is the location in mouse relevant to uh, human? And there's been a lot of work at the sequence level. People aligned all of mouse and human together and found 40% align at the sequence level, but not all of it's necessarily constrained. Um, Measures like Philo P and FastCons, they've been sort of a widely used representation of sequence information, and they find between 3 and 8% of human genomes sort of constrained within um, that range of um, mammals. Um, but we ha now have this complementary view of um, human and mouse based on this functional genomics data. Um, and a lot of the previous comparisons of the functional genomics data tend to be restricted to a single data type or cell or tissue type. Um, but sort of inspired by like these score representations that in a sense measured um, conservation, we were asking could we do something analogous um, between human and mouse, leveraging the thousands of data sets in human and mouse to produce what we termed um, a LACIF score, learning evidence of conservation from integrated functional genomic annotations. Um, and one of the challenges here is we don't have this one-to-one -one correspondence between human and um, mouse data sets. Um, so we needed to integrate them um, sort of without knowing specifically their like biological origin of these different uh, features. And we're, we're only presenting evidence of um, conservation. We can't exclude things. We might not have had the assay um, in the right cell type that might have been conserved. But the um, idea of the method was we use sequence alignment to train um, the data, but not as the feature. So Pairs of locations that align at the sequence level are positives, and then the features are the epigenomic data from human and mouse in a pair, and then the negatives are shuffles of this. So we align, take a human region and match it with the mouse region that it doesn't correspond to, um, and then that becomes um, these negative pairs, and similarly for a mouse region, and then we have an ensemble of neural networks to discriminate these positive and negative pairs. Um, and then we can, once we've trained this, we can go across the genome and apply it to um, any human and mouse pair, in this case, that aligned at the sequence level. Um, and then this was some of the data we applied it to, more than 8,000 data sets from human and 3,000 from mouse. And this is an illustration in the browser of what it looks like. You have um, the human data, and this is the mouse data. In this case, I'm showing a chromatin state model that was learned jointly between the two species, but we didn't um, use this, these annotations as input features. And you can see there's this um, sort of agreement where it gets a high LACIF score, but then other places where it gets this lower score where we have different cell types um, associated with activity. Um, and this is just a visualization more generally of places that got a high score where they have similar chromatin states. Um, with, while places that had low evidence either had um, this unmarked state in all the cell and tissue types or different states. Um, and then on average, genome-wide, we scored like promoter regions the highest, but like enhancers also were above average, while um, like a quiescent low region was below average. Um, and to summarize, I presented uh, Chrome HMM as a method for discovering chromatin states and cell type specific genome annotations. And I talked briefly about uh, chrome impute for epigenome um, imputation. 
uh, Chrome Gene for gene-based annotations and LACIF for human mouse uh, epigenome conservation. Um, and to acknowledge uh, the group, and I've put in bold some of the uh, people from my group whose work I talked about. And thank you for your attention.